Okay, so for today, our lecture will be about fertilization, pregnancy, and childbirth. So again, what's fertilization? So this is a process that begins when a sperm cell first con contacts with the coverings of the egg and ends with the intermingling of maternal and paternal chromosomes at the metaphase plate prior to the first cleavage. So again, with um, the start of uh, growth and development, if uh, all actually boils down or starts with what you call the fertilization process. So it is the process of, um, you know, the unity of the sperm and the egg. So in fertilization, there are actually several obstacles that must be overcome for a successful fertilization. So the first one would be um, the sperm and egg must come into proximity. So dapat malapit sila sa isa't isa. So fertilization would not happen if for example, masyadong malayo yung distance ng sperm sa egg. We all know that um, in the fertilization process, it's always the sperm that's traveling towards the egg. Okay? And then next is cell-to-cell -cell contact must occur. And then next would be... Yes. Po. yes. I'm sorry po. Hindi, yes. po, hindi po nag, ano, nag load po yung PowerPoint. Yung PowerPoint. Ah, okay. okay. Hindi nag-load sa inyo. Ayan lang ako. Ah, uh, share again. Ayan, okay na? Yes po, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So, next, um, the sperm must penetrate the egg cell. So, of course, before the sperm is able to penetrate the egg cell, may mga kailangan pang ceremonies or may mga dapat pang chemical reactions na mangyari before the sperm can penetrate. Okay, and then of course there is the prevention of polyspermy. So when you say polyspermy, uh, usually ang tinatanggap lang kasi ng egg ay isa lang. But there are times uh, that you know mul multiple sperms can actually um, penetrate the egg cell. So if that happens, of course there would be a possibility that an egg will develop a twin, maybe triplets or quadruplets. Okay, and then we have um, the metabolic activation of the egg. So there's always um, a triggering factor for, for the egg to be activated for fertilization. And then the completion of meiosis by the egg. So definitely um, from the arrest stage, dapat ang inyong egg ay viable for fertilization. Okay. And then the formation and fusion of male and female pronuclei leading to the first cleavage divisions. So those are or these are the steps or phases for us to be able to have a successful fertilization. So for the mechanisms for proximity, of course, the transport occurs in liquid medium. So for, you know, in mammalian um, fertilization, of course, the sperm would, um, would swim through the egg, of course, within a liquid medium. But of course, there are also other animals that um, depend also on different resources for its uh, for their transport. So for example, in the external fertilization, so for external ex uh, fertilization, usually fertilization happens outside the body of an organism like the frogs. So the eggs and the sperm simultaneously shed into the water. And then, um, of course, when the frog releases the, the uh, eggs, that's the only time that uh, the male frog will eventually be able to fertilize the eggs, okay? And then it also occurs in fishes, except for chondrichthyes uh, and in most anurans. For internal fertilization, so the fertilization happening within the body of an organism, so the sperm is introduced directly into the female tract through copulation, and usually it involves copulatory organs, for example, in males, um, you have the penis for the copulatory organ. And then for the females, you have your vagina. Okay. So none is present in tuatara, birds and salamanders, and their copulation is by cloacal kiss. Okay. So yung cloacal kiss na yun, so yung parang buta, yung butas ng puwet nila, magkikiss yun, and then eventually, dun, yun yung parang way of copulation nila. Okay. So, Sa chicken, for example, hindi pa naman kayo nakakita ng chicken na 
uh, nagko-copulate, right? So, most likely ang ginagamit nila ay cloacal case. Okay? And then, it also occurs in animals with shelled eggs or viviparous habitats as sperm must reach the egg before the shell is added. So, it is present with uh, chondrichthyes, most amphibians, and of course, the amniotes. So, for the mechanisms for contact, for internal fertilization, the sperm travels within the female tract by passive transport. So, when you say passive transport, it doesn't really require you much energy for you to travel. So, this is more, um, or the sperm is more likely dependent on the muscular contractions and ciliary currents provided by the female tract. So, when you say naman active transport, usually it would really require you to have um, ATPs for you to be able to do a certain movement or for you to be able to travel or to have a transport system. So, little uh, active swimming by sperm for transport function is um, observed. Okay? And then, contact in external fertilization is accomplished by random swimming movements of the sperm in the water. So, parang it's a combination of um, a passive transport and a little bit of um, a little bit of effort from the sperm. Okay, so it's also with the use of its flagella. So the mechanisms for egg barrier penetration. So once the egg or once contact with the egg has been established, the next step is to penetrate the egg so that the nuclear materials can unite to form the diploid zygote. So the barrier penetration mechanisms are chemical in nature and thus involve the acrosomal reaction. So, you know, the acrosome or the head of the sperm does have this chemical um, components wherein it is responsible for the acrosomal reactions. So we have the sperm lysines. These are enzymes that locally dissolve egg membranes. So these lysines are produced by acrosomal cap. And the sperm lysines differ among animal groups as membranes surrounding eggs differ as well. So you have a jelly coat in amphibians. You have the follicle cells of corona radiata for mammals. Okay. So those, um, uh, you know, those advan uh, advantages or um, uses of this sperm lysines would would also depend on what kind of organism they are trying to penetrate or what what type of egg uh, of an organism is uh, or they are trying to um, penetrate. Okay. For the acrosome reaction, it involves first the release of the sperm lysines. So in the term itself, lysines, of course, it lyses or it breaks something. And then next is the fusion of the egg and the sperm membranes. So in some animals, acrosomal reaction involves exposure of binding sites on plasma membrane of the sperm via acrosomal tubule or filament, which bind to receptors on plasma membrane of eggs in species-specific manner. And then this binding precedes fusion of the sperm and the egg plasma membranes. Okay, so if you have an idea about your membrane transports, of course, um, in the plasma membrane of um, of your cells, you have different types of um, chemical transports. No, for this um, lysines, uh, they use the um, tubule or filament model, okay, to bind to the receptor. So, which means that there are certain receptors that accept those lysines for it to be able to get into the barrier of the egg. Okay. So acrosome reactions in sea urchins, so in most marine invertebrates, the acrosomal reaction has two components. The first one would be the fusion of the acrosomal vesicle with the sperm plasma membrane, an exocytosis that results in the release of the contents of the acrosomal vesicle. Okay. So with the... Um, so when you say exocytosis, diba, nilalabas lang sila through um, a vesicle from the cell. So ganun lang ni -re release or that's the only way that uh, how the sperm releases the lysines. And then eventually those lysines, they are accepted by the egg membrane through receptors. Okay? 
And then next one, the extension of the acrosomal process. So the acrosomal reaction in sea urchins is initiated by the contact of the sperm with the egg jelly. And then the contact with egg jelly causes the exocytosis of the sperm's acrosomal vesicle and release the proteolytic enzymes that can digest a path through the jelly coat to the egg surface. Okay. So it's um, more likely that with sea urchins, it's very easy for, for the sperm to penetrate the eggs, which is why during fertilization of sea urchins, it doesn't really take long. You can actually observe it in a in a shorter period of time. Okay. So for the acrosome reactions in sea urchins, you have here an image that would show you the diagrams of the actual uh, acrosomal reaction in sea urchin. So A to C is actually the portion of the acrosomal membrane lying directly beneath the sperm plasma membrane. Uh, which fuses in the plasma membrane to release the contents of the acrosomal vesicle. So, in here you will see that um, this is the um, sperm cell. So, you have here the acrosomal membrane and then you have the globular actins. So, once it ruptures, the acrosomal enzymes are being released and then it will eventually be able to um, penetrate the egg. Okay. And then in letter D, the actin molecules assemble to produce microfilaments extending to the acrosomal process outward. So after this one, the acrosomal en enzymes being released in the uh, media, it will eventually have this actin formation, actin mic uh, microfilaments, and then you will see here binding okay. at the outer, um, outer portion of the sperm. So this one, it would actually show you the uh, summary of how the acrosome uh, process or acrosome um, penetration happens. Okay, so again, you have the contact where in the sperm contacts the egg jelly coat, triggering exocytosis from the sperm's acrosome. Okay, so this is the ac acrosome. Once it um, touches the jelly coat, it will already trigger exocytosis to release those lysines or the hydrolytic enzymes. And then next would be the acrosomal reaction wherein there's already the formation of the acrosomal process that will eventually release um, and have this what you call, uh, you see here that it has, um, or the chemicals that it releases are being received by chemical receptors. Okay, So once it's successful, of course, um, there will already be a successful contact of the sperm and the egg membranes and then, of course, the fusion of the plasma membranes of the sperm and the egg. Okay. So in here, you have the entry of the sperm nucleus already and then the, differ, uh, the space in between them is what you call the perivitelin space. And then, of course, the uh, cortical reaction Again, it is the fusion of the gamete membranes and uh, that triggers an increase of calcium in the egg's cytosol, causing cortical granules in the egg to fuse with the plasma membrane and discharge their contents. Okay, and then outside, you will see the fertilization envelope. So that's how um, easy it is for sea urchins to have the um, acrosomal reaction. Okay. So next, um, in mammals, there is no development of acrosomal filaments. Instead, fluids of the female reproductive tract induce capacitation. So this capacitation primes sperm for fertilization and includes removal of some components from the sperm surface. Okay? So there's already a difference about the egg um, barrier depending on what type of model organism. So if there are acrosomal filaments for sea urchins, for mammals, you have your capacitation process. So after capacitation, you have the hyaluronidase on the sperm head being exposed and breaks down the hyaluronic acid, cementing the follicle cells of the corona radiata. 
which is act actually the cells that surrounds the egg. So it allows the sperm passage through corona radiata to contact uh, zona pellucida, which is a glycoprotein layer surrounding the cell. So from our previous uh, lecture about uh, oogenesis, you already you, you should already know what a corona radiata is and what the zona pellucida is. So with the zona pellucida is actually spe uh, species specific receptors for binding the sperm. So just like um, in the acrosomal penetration of sea urchins, they do also have um, species specific receptors. So when you say sp uh, species specific receptors, um, they can only match with specific um, chemical receptors or chemical uh, components for them to be able to bind with the sperm. Okay, so it's just it's like a lock and key relationship. So you won't be o you won't be able to penetrate something or you will be op be able to open something if you will not use the correct key. Okay, so that's how your um your receptors actually work. Namimili sila ng kailangan nilang um, chemicals para maging successful yung penetration. Hindi po pwedeng etong receptor na ito tatanggap siya ng ibang klaseng chemicals. Hindi pwede. It will not be possible for the, that chemical uh, to be able to penetrate and to be able to have a successful penetration. Okay, so the binding causes rupture of the acrosome, which releases contents that break down the zona pellucida and allow contact with the egg plasma membrane. So the binding also exposes protein on sperm surface that bind with receptors on the egg plasma membrane to facilitate fusion of the sperm in the egg. Okay. So the fusion of plasma membranes re releases sperm genetic material into the egg as sperm pronucleus. And then the male and female genetic material will soon combine forming a diploid zygote. We all know that from before or before the process of fertilization, your um, the, the genetic material from the maternal and the paternal genes are just haploid. But after the process of crossing over or the combination of those genetic materials, you will already be having a diploid zygote. Hmm? So for the acrosomal reaction in mammals, you will see here in letter A, the image, this is actually the transmission electron micrograph of hamster sperm undergoing the acrosomal reaction and the acrosomal membrane can be seen to form vesicles. So letter B is the inter interpretative, uh, interpretative diagram of electron micrograph showing the fusion of the acrosomal and cell membranes in the sperm head. So you see here that this is the sperm cell membrane. You have the acrosomal membrane and then here's the nucleus. So the fusion between the sperm cell membrane and adjacent acrosomal membrane look like this. Okay, so once this is released, it will just expose the acros uh, acrosome head. Okay. So unlike the sea urchin, ibang iba yung itsura niya because it produces an acrosomal um, para siyang nagiging pin, nagkakaroon ng head. No? Nag-generate siya ng pin na itutusok niya dun sa pinaka-egg. Pero dito sa mga um, mammals, nag-dissolve uh, nag lang yung, mga, yung membrane ng cell, ng sperm cell ng mammals. And then eventually yung may expose na part no, yun yung magiging um, yun yung magiging key for the sperm to penetrate the egg. Okay? So for the mammalian fertilization, the sperm must pass several barriers to enter the egg. So for the fertilization of ma mammalian eggs, the sperm first passes through a layer of cumulus cell embedded in hyaluronic acid aided by the hyaluronidase activity on its surface. So in here, this, this image that you see here on your screen right now is actually just a simple representation of how a mammalian fertilization happens. So in this one, you will see the cumulus layer cells. You see here the binding um, of the sperm to the zona pellucida. So this is the acrosomal vesicle. The zona pellucida is right here. And then you have the uh, follicle cells. And then this one is already the egg okay, with its nucleus. 
And then the second layer is the zona pellucida, a layer of the glycoproteins, and then the acrosomal reaction, which is the release of enzymes in the sperm head, is mediated by the interaction of the ZP3 species specific receptor and adhesion molecules in the sperm head. Okay, so please take note of these types of um, uh, receptors. Okay, so for mammalian, you have the ZP3 species specific receptor. Okay. And then the acrosome releases the acrosine, a protease, and a acetyl glucosaminidase, which degrades the glycoprotein side chains. So eventually, once they are able to, you know, penetrate through the zona pellucida and then um, ignite the fusion of the plasma membranes, eventually, in this process, the sperm nucleus will be able to enter the egg cytoplasm. Okay, so those um, steps or phases is, is actually with the help of different um, proteases and um, glycoproteins. Okay, and then of course the specific uh, receptors found in the, um, in the membrane of the egg cell. Okay. So the sperm surface which contains proteins, for example, fertilin, can bind the egg surface and are exposed during the acrosomal reaction. So fertilin binds an integrin-like receptor of the egg plasma membrane to initiate sperm egg fusion. So only one sperm may enter an egg, and this is to prevent polyspermy. Enzymes that prevent other sperm from binding to the zona pellucida are released. Okay, but then again, sometimes um, there's a possibility of having polyspermy. But if, uh, technically, it, there's only kumbaga, the compatibility should be one is to one, okay? or the ratio should be one is to one. One egg is to one sperm. Okay. So this is the post fertilization responses in a zygote. So for the first one would be formation of fertilization cone. This is an outward bulge of egg cytoplasm that serves to engulf the sperm. And it occurs upon the fusion of sperm and egg plasma membranes. And then recession of the cone brings sperm includes into egg cytoplasm. So in here you will see a vitellin envelope and then the egg cytoplasm. So once it penetrates a jelly coat, again when you say jelly coat usually it's for sea urchins diba? so and then you have the acrosomal process and and then elevating fertilization cone okay lumalabas yung fertilization cone once nagkaroon na ng fusion dun sa pinaka membrane ng egg and yung sperm and then second one you have the egg activation upon fusion around three seconds only um, the membrane depolarization or hyperpolarization happens. So this is again species dependent. Okay, so depend the anong classing um, organism. They do have um, a different way of activating this, the egg cell. And then of course it blocks the entrance of more than one sperm. So you call it the fast block to polyspermy. Okay, so one is to one lang talaga. So next, um, get calcium release from internal stores within the egg triggers cortical reaction. So this is the release of cortical granules to perivitellin space around the egg. So if you have already or if you know about the concept of um, what they call this, um, cha uh, changes within the calcium levels and potassium levels of your cells, so it's very important that uh, you you know about it, okay? Or the sodium potassium um, reaction, okay? And then cortical granule release release cause development of fertilization membrane blocking further sperm entry or the slow block to polyspermy, and then slow block to polyspermy occurs about 25 to 30 seconds post fusion, and then. Uh, it seems to occur only for micro lecithal eggs like mama, the mammals and the entrance of the, uh, more than one sperm into eggs of birds, reptiles, and some amphibians are common. 
but only one sperm contributes to the zygote. Otherwise, others are somehow inactivated. So again, with other types of uh, model organisms, it's possible that more than one sperm can actually penetrate. But then again, only one can contribute to the uh, fertilization process of the egg. So ganun pa rin, parang one is to one. So uh, it's really like a battle of survival between uh, kung anong pinakamalakas na, na sperm meron ng isang organism and then kung sino yung mananalo sa kanila to be able to um, fertilize the egg. Okay? So this is the slow block uh, polyspermy. So it happens around 20 to 30 seconds. So um, just review on this one on how this happens. Okay? So about the bonds, the acrosomal processes, and of course, the substances. Okay, so it's just um, it's just like the fast block as well. Okay, it's just that this is more when you say slow block. Of course, it would take a longer time for for it to for the sperm to be able to penetrate the uh, the egg. So for fast block polyspermy, it involves the opening of the sodium channels in the egg plasma membrane, and then sodium flows into the egg cell depolarizing the membrane. So this depolarization prevents additional sperm from fusing the egg plasma membrane. So as you see here, if if there are, um, this is actually um, a diagram that shows how depolarization and repolarization happens when it comes to um, processes in your body. Okay, so when usually it would take about around negative milli, uh, 70 millivolts for your um, cells before it uh, it reacts to the addition of sperm. Okay, So if the sperm enters the egg, it would take around within one to three seconds after the egg, uh, after the fertilizing sperm enters the egg, and then potential sh shifts in a positive direction. So once the sperm enters, tumataas din yung um, block fast block nung inyong egg cell. So, kumbaga, if there's already an introduction of sperm in the egg, tumataas na yung parang pagbablock, yung capability ng cell to block other sperm so enter the membrane. Okay? So, ayan yun. So, the egg plasma membrane is restored to its normal negative 70 millivolts potential within minutes of fusion as the sodium channels close and other I positive ions flow out of the cell and the sodium is pumped out. If the polarization is prevented, polyspermy occurs, but how uh, but how the polarization blocks polyspermy is not yet fully understood. Okay, so um, do you have uh, do you have a clear um, understanding about the polarization and repolarization? Uh, is it some it is it something that um, you person personally know yung kung paano ba nangyayari yung depolarization repolarization wala so ganito kasi yan guys para maintindihan niyo nang maayos let me know pagka ano ah pag sinabi kasi natin uh, in, in in a normal state of cell so for example uh, bigay, magbigay ako ng uh, example na madaling intindihin like your muscle cells Okay. Si muscle cells kasi di ba guys, meron siyang, um, pwede siyang nasa resting stage and then meron siyang contraction and then meron din siyang pagbalik niya sa normal phase. Okay? So for example, if the, the, ang movement kasi ng muscle natin is all or none. Tama? So kapag ka nag-contract, lahat ng muscles mag-contract. Pero uh, hindi po pwedeng, ilang muscles lang yung gumagalaw. So, pag nag-contract lahat, lahat ng muscles, ko-contract yan lahat. Okay? So, itong sinasabi natin kasi dito sa mga de uh, levels of yung mga depolarization, repolarization, just by understanding this, um, this um, representation here or the graph, kapag sinabing negative 70 millivolts, parang ito yung tinatawag nilang resting stage. Okay? So, kumbaga, nasa normal state lang ang isang cell. Okay? Pero kapag ka nagkaroon ka ng um, added na 
uh, kung baga may nag-trigger ng isang movement or may nag-trigger na uh, na chemical mediator para gawin mo ang isang action. Usually, nagkakaroon tayo ng tinatawag nating depolarization. Yun yung pagtaas. Okay? So, for example, sa muscles, uh, usually, ginagamit nga natin yung sodium uh, potassium na sodium potassium channel. Okay? May tinatawag tayong C3 na antukin. So, kapag ka nagkakaroon ng Uh, contraction sa muscles, kailangan merong tatlong molecules of sodium na uh, lalabas and then may papasok dapat na dalawang potassium. Okay? So parang ganun din yung nangyayari dito sa uh, penetration ng sperm and egg. Kaya lang, ang mga ginagamit natin is the sodium and yung um, calcium ions. Okay? So, kapag ka nagkakaroon na ng mga fusion-fusion, so kailangan nagre-release ng mga um, sodium channels para magkaroon ng, ano, magkaroon ng, or may mga nagbubukas ng mga sodium channels para tumulong na magkaroon ng influx of energy. ba diba? Positively charged ang sodium, ba diba? So, kailangan ng isang cell, mas marami siyang energy para magkaroon siya ng Um, kumbaga, yung pinaka-epitome ng contraction niya, ima-reach niya. So, kumbaga, mas maraming sodium, mas maraming charge, so, mas lumalakas yung cell. Parang ganon. Okay? So, dito, sa sp pagka ang sperm nag-enter na or na-detect na ng cell, na naka-penetrate na yung sperm dun sa egg, so, tumataas ngayon yung Kumbaga parang pinip, yung pagpipigil ng egg cell sa ibang sperm na pumasok, tumataas yung level nun. So that's what you call depolarization. So kumbaga sa muscles natin, pag nag-contract yan, yung depolarization nun is yung pag-contract ng muscles. Okay? So kapag ka, for example, oh, sige, gawin nyo ngayon. You try to, di ba, open your hand, buksan nyo yung kamay nyo. So sabihin natin na yan yung resting state. Okay? Pag kinlose nyo yung hand nyo, yung talagang close yung fist nyo, di ba nagko-contract yung muscles? So that's what you call the depolarization process. Kumbaga lahat ng energy, lahat ng uh, pagpapatigas nyo sa muscles nyo, yun yung tinatawag na depolarization. Okay? But once nga na uh, nakapag uh, nakapag-penetrate na successfully, eventually dapat bumalik yung cell sa normal condition. So, when, if you, um, kung baga, dada, kung dadahan-dahanin nyo yung pagbukas ng kamay nyo, di ba, nawawala din yung pag-contract ng muscles. That's what you call now repolarization. Okay? So, sa, sa repolarization na yon sa contraction na yun ng muscles, dapat, wala nang papasok ng mga sodium ions. Okay? So, ang pumapasok na ngayon yan para mag-relax yung muscles natin is the potassium. Okay? So ganun yung nangyayari sa mga sa fast block polyspermy. Okay? So there would be at there will there will always be a time that the egg will have the polarization process and eventually will go down to repolarization. Pero sabi nga dito yung uh, Pero pag nakikita niyo dito sa graph natin no, hindi medyo hindi medyo matagal yung time na magre-repolarize yung egg. Okay? So, hindi siya agad-agad bumababa, unlike your muscles, na kapag ka release mo yan, definitely repolarization and then babalik siya sa normal condition. But for your egg cells, it's a different thing. Kapag ka nag-depolarize na siya, medyo matatagalan siyang bumalik kasi nga, they are in the process of fertil fertilization. So, kung baga pinipigilan ni egg na may iba pang pumasok na na sperm sa kanya until eventually that yung fusion ng kanilang membranes will already be successful and of course the exchange of the genetic material is already successful. Okay? Actually, ang egg nga at saka ang sperm parang hindi na sila bumabalik sa normal state eh, di ba? Kasi kung baga they are already um, trying to to produce uh, a zygote. So, ibig sabihin, mas maraming trabaho yung ginagawa nila. Kaya hindi bumabalik. Kaya hindi na halos siya bumabalik sa repolarization process. 
kumbaga parang lahat ng energy dere-derecho na lang for them to be able to successfully uh, reproduce a zygote. Okay? So ganyan nangyayari yung um yung kumbaga pagko-control ng egg when it comes to polyspermy. Okay? So next, uh, you will be having the rearrangement of internal constituents within the egg. So it sets up gradients of certain substances and plane of bilateral symmetry within the zygote for some animals. Okay, so again, yung mga gradients, of course, those are needed. Kung ano ba yung, parang bata lang, di ba? Ano bang kailangan ng isang bata para um, lumaki ng maayos? Of course, you have supplemental vitamins, you have kung ano bang kailangan ni mother, may mga iniinom si mother, ganon. Okay, so parang mas kailangan, kailangan na establish yung mga gradients na yun for them to be able to have a successful um, you know, fertilization process. And then fusion of haploid nuclei. So in most vertebrates, meiosis within egg arrest after first meiotic division and sperm entry stimulates second meiotic division to produce female pronucleus and a second polar body. So once the second division occurs, female pronucleus is ready for union with the male pronucleus. Okay. And then fusion of the haploid nuclei continuation. So the male and the female pronuclei next approach each other. This is the mechanism by which this movement occurs is not known with certainty. Okay. And then the next is um, the fusion of the pro pronuclei and in some animals, including most vertebrates, pronucleus membrane degenerates and free chromosomes arrange themselves at spindle, metaphase of meiosis, and then the completion of mitosis and then eventually being a diploid zygote. Okay. Next, we have parthenogenesis. So parthenogenesis is development of the egg and the absence of the sperm. So there are other animals that um, they can actually uh, fertilize by themselves without the presence of the sperm. Okay? So occurrence suggests that egg activation and nuclear fusion are separate developmental processes. And the ovum contains all the capacities nece necessary for embryo formation and that all that is necessary are some triggering agents. So eggs can be activated by a number of chemical. It can be thermal. Okay? It can be um, kumbaga environ an, an environmental factor. It can also be electrical or mechanical means. Okay? So, parthenogenic individuals are expected to be haploid, but these embryos are often diploid. So, doubling of chromosomes is, uh, is actually accomplished in three ways. First is the suppression of the second meiotic division, which occurs only in the eggs completing this division after fertilization. Next is the refusion with second polar body. And then the third one is the suppression of the first meiotic division or the first cleavage division. So usually yung mga parthenogenesis na to nangyayari siya dun sa mga animals na they have both the female and the male reproductive systems. No, hindi nila I mean they can self reproduce without even the introduction of the sperm. So that's what you call parthenogenesis. Okay? So haploid embryos generally show premature developmental arrest. And the parthenogenic diploid embryos also usually show premature developmental arrest. However, in several invertebrates, parthenogenesis is normal, like for example, male drones of the bee colony. And there are several species of naturally occurring parthenogenic lizards. So for example, the entire population is female. Okay, so those are the examples of um, you know, animals that could actually do parthenogenesis. And then artificial selection produce, uh, procedures have developed parthenogenic strains in turkeys naman. Okay. So this is the asexual, uh, all females with tail species or Seminodophorus neomexicanus, which reproduces via parthenogenesis, is shown uh, flanked by two sexual species having males 
the sea in Ornaius and the city Greece. So, ito yung in Ornaius and then the Tigris, which is hybridized naturally from the C. neomexicanus species. So, ito yung neomexicanus, yung nasa center. Pero pwede silang, because nga of parthenogenesis, no, nag, nagkakaroon sila ng, um, kumbaga, changes in characteristics. Okay. Ito mga male sila. Ito female. So, methods of bearing a young. So, ito yung mga different types of bearing um, a young. So, you have the oviparous, which are the egg layers. So, they are um, primitive condition for the vertebrates and occur in most fishes, amphibians, reptiles, all birds, and the monotremes. Next, you have the viviparous or the live bearing animals. They are advanced um, or they have the advanced condition in vertebrates. Some uh, live bearers occur in all vertebrate classes except the cyclostomes and the birds. And they are evolved by retention of eggs within the body to increase survival of the young. So, placental connections in viviparous vertebrates. So, amniotes with connection between yolk sac and maternal tissue through which exchange of metabolites occur, like in chondrichthyes. So, yung mga chondrichthyes, guys, ito yung mga types ng, yung sa mga shark, okay? So, they have this maternal tissue uh, that um, they use for them to be able to exchange um, metabolites or yung nutrition, okay? So, reptiles use yolk sac, chorion, and alantua or the extra embryonic membranes or some combination for connection. And then mammals with a variety of connections. Okay, so ito na yung mga tinatawag natin ng mga extra embryonic membranes na actually that would help when it comes to nourishing the young. Okay? So early development of the placentation in mammals. So after formation of the zygote, it undergoes cleavage and then eventually pr produces a blastula. So the blastula forms before the embryo reaches the uterus. And then mammalian blastula consists of the trophoblast and inner cell mass or the ICM becomes the embryo. Inner cell mass, yung ICM. Okay. And then upon reaching the uterus, the trophoblast overlying the ICM makes contact with the uterine endometrium and then the trophoblast cells rapidly multiply and insert among epithelial cells lining the endometrium and endometrial cells degenerate. So this is already what you call now the implantation phase. Okay. And then continued trophoblast cell division and then is actually the placentation. And then embryo becomes buried within the endometrial lining. So from there, eventually, uh, the em embryo will grow. Okay. So this is uh, an image uh, about the uh, reproduction in mammals and embryonic fetal development. So as you see here, again, these are the inner cell mass. You have the blastocele. Okay. And then if this is the uterine wall, Ganto siya nagkumakabit. Okay. So once na nakakabit na siya dun sa uterine wall, doon na magkakaroon ng differentiation. So for example, the reproduction of the syncytio, uh, syntrotrophoblast and then the synci, uh, syn cytotrophoblast and then of course the yolk sac and then the amniotic cavity. So in this one, it would show you the embryo already and then different sinuses and then the chorion. So depending on what kind of um, organism, kung anong mga klaseng connections or placental connections yung meron sila. But, but definitely for mamas, it would actually look like this for, for the blastula and then eventually sticking into the uterine wall. Okay? So mammalian placenta formation, so the structure produced by apposition and fusion of extra embryonic membranes of the embryo with uterine endometrium of the mother. So for the extra embryonic membranes, these are tissues uh, that are external to the embryo, which is not participating in the embryo formation, but functioning in the maintenance of the embryo. Okay, so for the embryo, it's more likely 
um, the it's it it's more likely that the sperm and the egg is responsible, but then the extra embryonic membranes are just supportive tissues for the maintenance uh, for the maintenance and growth of the embryo. So in amniotes, four extra embryonic membranes actually exist. So first we have the yolk sac. So this forms from the extra embryonic hypomere or the splanchnopleur that extends to enclose the yolk. This is the only extra embryonic membrane present in anamniotes, so it occurs in all vertebrates. And it functions to derive nutrients from the yolk in yolky eggs to nourish the developing embryo. Okay, so diba guys, if you remember, um, there are different types of um, eggs depending on the amount of yolk they have. Okay, so yun nga, with the yolk, kung mas marami, of course, it would really be utilized for the nutrition of the young or the developing embryo. Okay, so in amniotes, extra, extra embryonic somatopleur grows over embryo by folding back on itself, producing a double hood of somatopleur, and from this structure, it develops the amnion and the chorion. So outgrowth of the splanchnopleur from posterior region of the gut in amniotes eventually expands to fill extra embryonic cilum. This is the space between the amnion and the chorion. And then this membrane is the uh, allantois. It is composed of the uh, splanchnic mesoderm outside plus the endoderm. And then the mesoderm fuses with mesoderm of chorion to form the chorioallantoic membrane which is the main gas exchange organ of the amniote embryos. And then the allantois also serves waste storage function. Okay, so this is the uh, an example of the extra embryonic membrane formation in the bird. So as you see here, uh, you have the somatopleur, the splanchnopleur, extra embryonic silum, the chorion, the embryo is here, the amniotic cavity, the amnion, the allantoic cavity, and then the allantois, and then the yolk sac. And then outside it is the albumen, kung saan nagsuswimming yung inyong embryo, and then of course the outer shell. So in this figure, this is still underdeveloped. Okay, so, but then again, these are the components of your extra embryonic membranes. So in this one, you will see also the development for um, the extra embryonic membrane of the bird. Okay, so you have here the amniotic fold. This is the embryo. You have the ectoderm, mesoderm, and the endoderm. So in here, you see the gut, the allantois, the somatopleur, and the splanchnopleur. And then, of course, eventually, while the uh, embryo of the bird develops. It will eventually have the chorion, the amnion, the allantois, the amniotic cavity, the allantoic stock, the allantoic cavity, and then the yolk stock. Okay, and then eventually it forms the chorio allantoic membrane. Okay. So depending also on the age of the embryo, kung, ke, kung ano yung mga magda-develop sa kanya na extra embryonic membrane. Next, for the mammalian placenta, so from chorion, which is the outermost extra embryonic membrane, it is actually a finger-like process that grow outward to interlock with the uterine um, endometrium. So blood streams of mother and the fetus never mix. It is always separated by epithelial membrane, so exchange of gases and nutrients occurs by diffusion across this membrane. Okay, so it's more likely by simple diffusion lang ang um, pag-exchange ng nutrients with mother and the young. Okay, so chorion is not in direct contact with embryo, so some means of blood supply from embryo to placenta must occur. So blood supply to developing embryo differs between marsupials and placental mammals. So for marsupials, mostly they have the chorio fetal placenta. 
So the yolk sac is associated with the inner surface of the chorion. And then the blood vessels develop in the mesoderm of the yolk sac. And in this situation also occurs to some extent in several placental groups like your rodents. And then for placentals, you have the chorioallantoic fetal placenta. So this is dominant connection to the chorion that provides by Alantoa, yolk sac, and usually they degenerate. And then the Alantoic mesoderm fo forms blood vessels that function in gas and nutrient exchange and waste removal. Okay. So this is the fetal extra embryonic membranes in various amniotes. So in this one for the legend, for the blue ones, you have the ectoderm and then the yellow ones is the endoderm. The pink one with uh, black dots is actually a somatic mesoderm or the avascular. And then the other one, with the black lines with pink circles are the splanchnic vascular mesoderm. So here you will see how they develop. Okay, so for example, a lizard or the pseudo, uh, pseudemo, pseudemoya, okay, you have the pl uh, placentum, you have the chorion de alantoa, which makes up the uh, alantoic or the colioallantoic placenta. And then you have the amnion, and then of course the yolk sac, and then the yolk cleft. So for Marsupials like the opossum, here you see the alantoa, it has a chorion, okay. it has a alantoic um, placenta or the chorioallantoic placenta. Okay. Para, para silang nagbabundle bundle with each other. Ayan. And then the yolk sac. Ayan. So those are the fetal extra embryonic membranes in uh, or the differences in different amniotes. Right? So for the types of mammalian placenta, first we have the primitive uh, condition. This is the apposition without fusion or non deciduous and then the advanced condition or the fusion of the maternal and fetal tissues or the deciduous type of placenta. So four types actually occur. You have the epitheliochorial, which is the most primitive type. This occurs in pig and some other mammals. And then you have the maternal and fetal blood separated by six layers. You have the endothelium um, and then connective tissue, epithelium, epithelium, connective tissue, and then endothelium. So that is the uh, levels or the different um, types of a uh, cell that comprises the uh, layers or or the uh, type of mammalian placenta uh, an animal has. Okay. Next we have the syndesmochorial. This is for no uterine epithelium which occurs in ruminant mammals like cattle and sheep. You also have the endotheliochorial, no maternal epithelium or connective tissue, which occurs in carnivores. And then the hemichorial, which is the advanced condition of the plas mama, uh, mammalian placenta. This has a chorionic epithelium base in maternal blood and occurs in primates and many rodents. So in this one, you will see the internal structure of the placenta. So the diagram shows variation in the number of tissue layers separating the maternal and fetal blood supplies in different systems of the placental mammals. So the number uh, varies from one layer in uh, hemoendothelial system to six layers in an epitheliochorial system. Okay. So in here you will you will see the fetal which has capillary walls, connective tissues and the trophoblast. And then for the maternal, you will see the uterine epithelium, connective tissues, and then the capillary walls. So these are the different um, examples okay, of, the, of their structures. So next for the childbirth, usually childbirth occurs in three stages. The first stage is the time of the onset of true labor until the cervix is completely dilated to 10 centimeters. 
And then the second stage is the period after the cervix is dilated to 10 centimeters until the baby is delivered. And then the third stage is the delivery of the placenta. So the stages of labor. So first stage of labor is the longest and involves three phases. The first one is the initial or the latent labor phase. This is the time of the onset of labor until the cervix is dilated to three centimeters. And then next you have the active labor phase. It continues from 3 cm until the cervix is dilated to 7 cm. And then the transition phase continues from 7 cm until the cervix is fully dilated to 10 centimeters. So this, are, this is um, a diagram showing the different stages. So for the initial or the latent phase, it looks like this. And then eventually, uh, for the active phase, as you see, the vagina is continually open, okay, or the cervix, and then the transition. Usually, for uh, humans, uh, it is more likely that the head is uh, the first one to be to parang to, to go out of the cervix, no? Para mas madaling hatakin yung buong body ng baby, okay? So emergence of distinctly human features. So the fetus, this is a human from week nine of development to birth. A human embryo takes on a vertebrae appearance with its pharyngeal arches and tail by the fourth week. And then by the beginning of the fetal period, the tail is gone and the developing individual has distinctly human features. Okay, so this is actually one of the um, Differentiation characteristics that a human has. Tiba nga yung tailbone natin. Um, if you come to, if you come across already of the evolution, di ba sabi, the closest um, example of animals that were close to are the primates or the monkeys. Okay, so ang monkeys, they have long tails. But eventually there are, there are also monkeys that no, that didn't, uh, develop long tails already. Meron sa kanila maliliit na lang ang tails. And then sa atin, um, eventually it diffused. Kaya walang tails ang mga humans. Okay? So, meron, tala, meron din tayong um, kumbaga tail no? Nung, when it comes to the uh, early development of the human embryo. But eventually it degenerates. Okay? So the, the emergence of distinctly human features for week four, embryos still less than one centimeter long. So in here, you will see how the yolk sac connecting stock and the embryo looks like if it's embedded on the uterine wall. And then in week four, you will already see the forebrain, future lens or the eyes, the pharyngeal arches, and then you have the developing heart and then the upper limb. You have the somites and then the neural tube forming the and then the lower limb bud and then the tail. Okay. The next you have weeks five to six growth actually is slow and details of the organ begin to fill. Limbs form, fingers and toes are sculpt, uh, sculpted. Okay. And then the umbilical cord in the circulatory system also develops and then the growth of the head surpasses that of all the other regions. So in here, makikita nyo talaga na um, compared to the different parts of the body, it is the head that is mas malaki pag the, uh, within the start of the development of a fetus. Okay. And then next for week eight, this is the final week of the embryonic period. So the embryo looks distinctly human compared to the other vertebrae embryos. And at the uh, end of the eighth week, all organ systems have formed and the individual is described as a human fetus. Okay. So in the second trimester or four months to six months, this is already the reflexive, uh, wherein reflexive movements begin as developing nerves and muscles are already connected. So at five months, fetal heartbeat can be heard clearly through a stethoscope. And in the sixth month, eyelids and eyelashes already form. 
In week 16, the length is already 16 centimeters or 6.4 inches, and the weight is already 200 grams or 7 ounces. Okay. And then in the third trimester, eyes open during the seventh month. The start of the final trimester is uh, months seven to nine. By this time, all portions of the brain have formed and have begun to function. And then 38 weeks is considered full term and births before 37 weeks are actually called premature. Okay. And then week 38 is the full term. So length is around 50 centimeters or 20 inches. Weight is around 3,400 grams or 7.5 pounds. And then usually for uh, we use the CRL um, measurement or the crown rump length uh, to measure embryos, even humans or and even um, like chick embryos. Okay, ginagamit natin yung um, measurements na yun. Okay. And then the placenta, the placenta forms early in pregnancy. By the third week, chorionic villi are growing into pools of maternal blood in, in, in the endometrial tissue. And then embryonic blood vessels extend through the umbilical cord to the placenta and into the chorionic villi where pulled materia, maternal blood surrounds them. And then maternal and embryonic blood streams never mix. Okay. So life, uh, you know, the umbilical cord and the placenta is actually the life support system of a developing human. Okay. So ito yung guys yung tinatanggal or tinatawag nila in Tagalog as inunan. Kailangan tinatanggal to after giving birth. Okay. Kasi nga, um, meron siyang blood, di ba? So kapag ka hindi kasi siya natanggal ng maayos, of course, the blood flow would continue. And eventually kapag hindi siya naagapan, it, there's, there would be a possibility that the mother can die. Okay. So, ito naman, um, of course, if if the umbilical cord is also uh, kumbaga, detached from the mother, of course, the baby has the capability of supporting himself already because we should expect that the respiratory system of the baby is already fully developed. Okay. So, the... The fetal, uh, the fetal blood flowing in the vessels of the chorionic villi exchanges substances by diffusion with maternal blood around the villi. So this is actually how it looks like. So if this is the umbilical cord, you will see the different fetal blood vessels inside the umbilical cord. And then this is the pool of the maternal blood. So in here you will see um, that the exchange of materials. Okay, So you have here the chorionic villus with the fetal blood vessels inside it and then the maternal blood in the uterine. So the flow is just very simple. It's um, ano lang, diffusion, simple diffusion lang. So ibig sabihin those uh, nutrients or maybe the blood can actually just go in and out of the different cells. Okay. So for the functions of the placenta, of course, this is for the exchange of materials between the embryo and its mother that takes place across the placenta. And the placenta is a pancake-shaped blood and gorge organ made of uterine lining and the extra embryonic membranes. And the fetus or embryo is connected to the placenta by an umbilical cord. Substances move between maternal and embryonic blood by diffusing across the embryonic vessels in the chorionic villi. Oxygen and nutrients diffuse from maternal blood into the embryonic blood and waste diffuse the other way and the mother's body disposes of them. So from the third month on, the placenta produces large amount of um, HCG or human chorionic gonadotrophin and then progesterone and estrogens that help maintain the uterine lining. So for maternal health, vitamin and mineral deficiencies can affect um, the development of a young. So you can have folate deficiency, which causes neural tube defects. Again, with neural tube defects, it would definitely have impacts on the nervous system of the baby. 
Okay. And then you have also iodine deficiency, which causes cretinism or the def deficiency naman when it comes to the uh, development of the body parts of the baby. Okay. So viruses can also pass, uh, can be passed from the mother to her embryo. For example, rubella or the German measles, which can cause birth defects. And HIV, uh, an HIV infected mother can also infect her child. Okay, so many toxins can also cross the placenta and affect the development like alcohol, caffeine, drugs, medications, tobacco, and tobacco smoke. Kasi nga, simple diffusion lang siya. So, baga, the, the components of these different um, toxins can just go in and out of the, um, of the placenta. Unlike other types of... Um, you know, membrane transports, they, they use different, um, you know, receptors, they have different channels for them to, um, to, you know, maximize or to regulate the chemicals that come in and out of the, of the cell. But in this one, since it's just with simple diffusion, it's more, um, kumbaga, mas madaling pumapasok yung mga toxins na yun sa baby. Okay, and all of these actions would definitely um, have an effect on the baby. Okay, so for birth and lactation, so shifts in hormone levels control birth, labor, and the milk production or the lactation. So for the labor, expulsion of the placental mammal from its mother's uterus by muscle contractions, and then lactation is the milk production by female mammal. Giving birth, typically the amnion ruptures right before birth so that the amniotic fluid drains out from the vagina. And then the cervical canal dilates, strong contractions propel the fetus through the cervix, then out through the vagina. And then strong muscle contractions also detach and expel the placenta after birth, and the umbilical cord is cut and tied. Okay. So ito yung tinatawag natin na kapag sa uh, giving birth, more likely ang ginagamit dito is yung um, positive feedback loop. Okay, so, you know, they it, it would really need to have a lot of energy and stimulation um, for for a female to, to give birth. Okay. So, the fetus position for childbirth. Uh, fetus is positioned for childbirth. Its head is against the mother's cervix, which is dilating or widening. Okay, so usually nga dapat ulo, okay, yung uh, mas dikit dun sa cervix ni mother. And then muscle contraction stimulated by oxytocin forces the fetus to go out through the vagina. And then the placenta detaches from the wall of the uterus and it is being expelled. So that actually ends uh, my lecture about fertilization, childbirth, and uh, pregnancy. Do you have any questions or clarifications? May tanong guys? <laughs> 